Hey, we're live. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> right. Good afternoon and welcome to another Let's Chat interview. Um, me, Lisa, again here doing the interviews with my uh, colleague uh, Elric doing the tech stuff. And uh, jumping in with any questions that you'd like to ask via our Facebook page. Um, we have Leslie interpreting again for us today so welcome back and today's interview is with Brian Robson, Managing Director of Drag Enterprises. Hi Brian, um, could you give us uh, like what Bragg Enterprises is because not many people actually understand or may not know what you actually do. Okay, firstly uh, thanks for the invite today. Uh, I do appreciate uh, an opportunity. Uh, I, I like to tell people all about Bragg uh, and the work that we do. Uh, for those of you that, that, that don't know uh, Bragg, Bragg actually stands for Benarty Regeneration Action Group and was of the first uh, community-led regeneration companies in Scotland. Um, regeneration was very much um, the buzzword within government and the government set up a number across uh, uh, Scotland and uh, many of them in high deprivation areas. Um, the people of Benarty felt left out that they hadn't been given one of their own given that the uh, closure of the heavy industry and coal mines in, in this area, the Benarty area was actually quite detrimental to this area with high unemployment. They felt so aggrieved that they said well um, if the government's not going to do it, we'll do it ourselves. So Bragg was actually formed by members of the community back in 1988. Um, they got some support in relation to uh, setting themselves up as a constituted group. And predominantly at that time, their focus was on uh, looking at uh, retraining and employment opportunities for those that had lost their, their jobs within the coal mining industry within the area. As not many people know, but at one point there was 21 pits uh, in what they call the Benarty Basin, which uh, is an area that stems from the bottom of Benarty Hill at Belingri, all the way around through the Benarty villages, Loch Gelly, Lumfinans, all the way around to Kelty. Uh, and that whole area was rich in coal and had been mined for coal for hundreds of years. So when the coal industry disappeared in this area, it left a huge void in relation to job opportunities, both within the mining industry itself, but also within the support industries and local business. And this, I was told at the time that unemployment was, was one in three uh, adults in the, the area were unemployed. Um, so there was a huge job to do um, to find new jobs for these people, particularly given many of them had worked in industries where they had low skill levels, low attainment uh, at school uh, because everybody went into the pits. Um, so there was real inequality within within the district. Um, and there was a feeling within local community that there wasn't enough being done to support these people, uh, hence the creation of Bragg. That's really good. Um, what what is it that um, with lockdown? Because you know many people have come together because of lockdown and started new things to help their local community. What extra services has Bragg been able to do for the communities that you help the most? Well, traditionally, uh, as an organisation, our uh, background has mainly been in employability and training uh, and I have a team, a staff team here at Bragg, 24 staff that work across Fife uh, and we are the lead partner in the Fife Employment and Training Consortium. Uh, so routinely support about 1100 people a year uh, move into some form of sustainable job or opportunity. Uh, we also work to help unemployed people move into self-employment through our new enterprise, new enterprise allowance program. Um, so in Fife, we help about 220 people a year. 
Um, now, obviously, with COVID-19 coming along, uh, we had a situation that overnight we had to move from people coming in and uh, attending training courses and getting one-to-one -one support to remote working. Uh, luckily, and, and I say luckily, um, we hadn't preempted, we hadn't had a, a crystal ball and seen COVID coming, but we decided about a year ago that we would move to a more mobile workforce in the sense that historically all the staff had a desktop, they had a desk, and they worked either from our premises in Cross Hill or from our premises in Methyl. We took a decision strategically as a board about a year ago to move to more remote working, um, more flexible working, and invested a lot in buying laptops to moving all our servers and all our data to the cloud. So when it looked like we were moving to lockdown, we were able to make that transition very, very quickly. Uh, yeah. What we did, however, have to do is produce a lot of online material and then buy additional equipment to pass on to our service users so that they could um, take place in Zoom calls or Teams calls uh, or get access to some of the tutorials that we were we were uh, videoing and producing uh, to share. Uh, and we done that. I, I mean, I was really impressed by how quickly the team responded and, and came up with this new ways of working. As a consequence of that, um, we never actually seen a dip in any of the numbers of people we were supporting uh, or the amount of jobs that we were creating uh, in that time. Uh, and, and I actually am quite proud of that, that as an organisation that we made that transition so quickly. Um, what we did, however, have, and it's a, it's a, as a social enterprise and one of Scotland's first social enterprises, we also have other income streams that are not um, grant led. Uh, and one of that is the fact that our old site in Cross Hill, um, maybe best I'll give you a bit of history. The history was is back in 1988, when the BRAG was formed, um, the local primary school had just closed. So Cross Hill Primary School uh, closed because Loch Gelly High School had been built and they decided to reconfigure the estate. The old school was lying empty. The community went to the education authority at that time and said, we could use the school for providing training. Fast forward 30 years and uh, we still deliver some of our services and training from here, but we also rent out uh, space. So we have industrial units, we have starter porter cabins, and we have office, warehouse type space here at Cross Hill. So we have about 36 businesses based here as tenants. Now, all of these people, by and large, apart from one other organization, are all local people that we've helped set up their business. And um, if we hadn't been here, we probably wouldn't operate in this area. They would have to set up in Glen Rothes or another area. So it's been a real assistance for the regeneration of the area. Um, so the first thing that we did was I took a, my, a member of the team offline and I said, right, your job is to help the tenants. Because I knew at the end of this lockdown that um, if the tenants were, didn't survive COVID and their businesses didn't survive, that would have an impact on us. But more importantly, it would have an impact on this community. So I knew that although I wasn't being funded or paid to do it, that they were the lifeblood of Bragg and one of the reasons that Bragg was set up. So I took a manager offline and said, right, your job is to now support all of those tenants, uh, both here at Cross Hill, but our, our business centre also in Methyl as well. And as a consequence of that, every one of the businesses uh, that walk, went into lockdown that were based here are still here. You know, um, and that's not true of many other business centres, I would suggest, that not of all of their businesses have come through in one piece. And, and when I say businesses, I'm talking about so, small, there's everything from um, fruit and veg, uh, wholesalers, garages, car valeters, photographers, um, pipe bands, uh, people 
um, everything. So we provided a benefit to them during lockdown, which has helped them survive. The other thing that we did fairly quickly was we recognised that there would be a lot of people that would quickly um, suffer because of lockdown um, that were already living in poverty. So if you were already in poverty within the Barati area and you were suddenly not able to go to the shops with the limited income that you had, and you didn't necessarily qualify from support from the food bank, that access to affordable food was going to be a real issue for you. Because people then had to start shopping at the local shops where the prices are a lot higher. Uh, it is very much convenience food as well. So within 10 days, um, we had set up a community pantry arrangement. Uh, we'd seen a similar arrangement operating previously over in Methyl, over in Leaven, I should say, and we thought we could do something like that here. So within 10 days, we'd set it all up. We'd gone out, we'd bought big commercial fridges, we'd set uh, up social distancing, we'd set up storage arrangements, we'd been in touch with uh, Fair Share to arrange deliveries of food. We'd spoken to uh, Baines the Bakery, uh, who uh, the bakery is in the Bernard area, and they agreed to give us a free produce. Uh, we spoke to Morrison's, they agreed to give us produce and support as well. So we set that up. Um, we're now at 22 weeks and every Thursday the pantry opens um, to members of local community to come in and access uh, affordable food. Now initially for the first 18 weeks we'd secured a little bit of funding from the lottery which allowed us to provide that as a free service. So everybody that came in, uh, we would ask how many was in the household and we would provide them with free produce uh, every Thursday. Uh, we had all the social distancing measures in place that we set up both for the queue outside, but also in relation to, to keeping the volunteers and the staff safe, as well as the people coming through. And for those that couldn't uh, get in, uh, because of health conditions or disabilities or were, were having to shield because somebody else was um, vulnerable within the household, we then started doing deliveries. Mm -hmm. Continued that service throughout. The only difference now is um, the amount of free produce we get has diminished, so we're having to um, pay for the deliveries now or pay for the uh, goods coming in. So we've made a, a small charge of three pound uh, a week per person, whether you're getting you're coming in or whether you're um, getting a delivery, and that just covers the cost of the food. Of everything, yeah. We've also built a huge bank of volunteers from the local community who come in every Thursday, Friday, and either help package uh, stuff up, distribute stuff, or deliver. Um, and it's been a real community effort. We've just kind of had the ability that we had the space mm -hmm. uh, and we could mobilise it fairly quickly. Uh, and our intention would be longer term that this is something that would be sustainable even after COVID-19. Because I think in, in most impoverished communities, yes, it's, it's good that people have access to a food bank for when things are critical. But I think there's lots of other people who are maybe even in work but living in poverty that still require access to affordable food. Mm -hmm. Won't replace everything that they would possibly buy for the supermarket, but it might give them the basis that what they then have to buy, um, their money goes a bit further. Yeah. Do you think that's going to make a, a stronger argument for people to think about social enterprises and having value staying in the community somewhere? Uh, or do you think it's at the moment it's trying to make sure uh, even small businesses don't struggle and don't fall because of the stresses on them? Do you think? I think I, th I think as we we understand and the whole diversity model is we have to accept that, that there's a place for everybody, uh, and I think that that's true within any community that we need to have a mixture of private enterprise, social enterprise, and public enterprise, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm all a great believer in social enterprise. I'm actually the chair of the Five Social Enterprise Network um, and have been a 
I've num run a number of social enterprises in the last 20 years. Um, and I love the social enterprise model. You know, I, I've run my own business as, a, as a, uh, an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I have worked in the private sector. I've worked in the public sector. Uh, and I feel very much at home within the charitable sector, but where there is an element of social enterprise. Because I, I do understand that the, the grant structure that we've all got used to, um, we've all got used to within the sector, um, is only going in one direction. Mm -hmm. If you can bring in other income streams that fit with your aims as, as a charity and an organisation, um, that's actually to the community's betterment. But I also accept that the, the heartbeat of every community is your small, small, small traders and small local businesses. Mm -hmm. When we talk about, and government talks about inclusive growth, that's really the kind of growth we need to see. Gone are the days where we looked at regeneration as some big employer coming in with 100 jobs or 200 jobs. And it's interesting, you know, at the moment, the big, the big thing on the horizon is the Talgo factory in, in Concordia. Now, yes, that's going to bring in uh, a lot of jobs. It's going to bring a lot of high um, and proficient jobs that will require people at a certain standard. Um, but when you consider 85% of business is small business and micro business, we all need to make sure that we're not just um, hoping for this white knight to come over and create hundreds of jobs. That we can actually do more by actually stimulating that economic growth within the smaller communities. And I think as well, we need to move away from the mentality of that we create jobs in the, the, the bigger towns and the cities. Um, I, I have to be honest and say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a great fan of the city deals for that mm. reason, because the city deal works on the premise that if you invest in the cities, there will be a trickle down economy to the outlying areas. But all that really does is it creates a commuter belt where people then have to travel to jobs. Mm -hmm. Fine if you have that social mobility and you have a car and a driving license and can you get can afford it anyway. The job that, yeah. But if you live in an area where public transport is poor and you don't have a driving license or a car because within your household that's a luxury, um, you're automatically disadvantaged. So I think the more jobs, we almost need to go back to the old model where, um, if I remember back to my youth, which was a long time ago, ah, the situation that jobs were <laughs> created uh, on your doorstep, you know, mm -hmm. factories and housing were, were cheap by jowl. Um, if you look at what we've created now, we've created these big industrial estates out of town where you need a car to get there. There's very little public transport. We need to go back to that old community model where there's businesses created in every town and every village, um, and villages and, and residential areas are not miles away from where the jobs are. Mm -hmm. It's more solid as well. It can. It's a more resilient model. Even if the economy is, is shaky, uh, your local jobs still make sense locally. You yeah. don't need to travel really far for them. I mean, a, a, a good example is if you look at uh, Dulloch and Dunfermline, <clears throat> commuter belt, you know, thousands of houses. Now, the, the irony for me is um, I, I, I was brought up um, within an impoverished community. I was brought up in Abbey View, um, I, and I remember tough times. Um, my mom was a single parent uh, with three kids to bring up and, and had a number of part-time jobs to try and you know, keep a roof over our heads. Um, and when I look at Dunfermline now and I look at Dollard Park, which was fields when I was a child. Uh, and if you'd said to me back then, yeah, that there's going to be houses over there, thousands of houses, uh, and people are going to be paying quarter of a million pounds for those houses, I would have, I would have laughed at you uh, because I just would never have seen it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, these people don't necessarily bring money into the local economy because what in essence is happening is they're taking up work in Edinburgh or across the bridge Mm -hmm. because that's where they would really like to stay because that's where their jobs are, that's where their friends are, that's probably where they were brought up, now being priced out of the, the, the housing market and the only place they can afford to buy a house is in Fife. 
Um, and in essence, then, when they socialise or they spend money, they go out in Edinburgh. Um, now, they might not do, be doing it at the moment because of COVID, but to a certain extent, they don't have the same connection with the community that they were brought up in. Uh, and I think that that's important, particularly when people then start saying, well, I've actually done quite well in life now. I want to give something back. I don't have a connection with this community, you know, because I don't really know anybody apart from my immediate neighbours. Uh, and I think that that's quite sad that we've lost that because we've gone down this kind of city model of uh, it's quite acceptable for people to commute hmm. to where the jobs are. But um, it's something we're talking about, trying to increase the, uh, the five pound and basically how it works. Well, I, I don't know if you've if you've heard uh, of the Preston model. Um, the Preston model. Uh, um, I, I went down to Preston uh, a few years ago, and, and the Preston model works on the basis that uh, every pound spent in the community and then respent in the community is more productive than a pound spent out with the community. Mm -hmm. The Preston model works as if the, the council as being one of the big spenders and NHS within the area are asked to report back on when they award contracts or they spend money, where does that money spend? Is it spent on local suppliers? Is it spent on um, supporting local uh, activities? Or is it given to some national organisation whose head office is down south mm -hmm. and where the staff, their staff provide a service from the other side of the country? Um, so what they're asked to do now is, is report on that. And, and I, I, I think that should be looking at that and saying, should we be doing more to, to get um, the big um, spenders, the big businesses, um, the council, NHS, to demonstrate their, where they spend their money? Now, if you look at Fife Council as an example, I think their budget is say 700 million pounds a year, uh, give or take. If you then went on the basis that Fife has seven localities, so you would suggest then that the council spends equivalent to 100 million pounds in each locality. So that's 100 million pounds in Cowdenbeath, 100 million pounds in Kirkcaldy. You then said to the council, okay, demonstrate that you've spent 100 million pounds in Cowdenbeath. So it's created jobs, it's created employment in Cowden Beef that's worth 100 million. And it's not all disappeared to contractors from Edinburgh or down south or suppliers from out with your own area. I think that that's something that we should aspire to, to actually be able to demonstrate that we are doing more um, to spend money in our own communities. I had to change camera, the other one dropped off, so I'm here, but I still keep going. <laughs> I thought you had a twin. <laughs> I wondered what was going on here. Uh, uh, I had a message from my colleagues that uh, it, it had not appeared, so I, I just made sure it worked. I went, I switched computers to check. Uh, we, we have a session recorded anyway, so it will, it will pop up. I'll so be there. It will be there. With nothing else. It's just you will not broadcast it will be there. So, yeah, but, but I think definitely when we picked up this, uh, this idea that uh, we, we, we travel so much in the UK, it's been fine. Uh, Elric, sorry, can I just interrupt and say that you're sound like you're underwater, can't hear you at all. Uh, okay, uh, I'll try. I don't know if it's just me. A bit of echo. Bit yeah, of echo. feedback. Okay, okay I'll try and sorry. cut the sound off from one and see if it works. Is that better? That's better. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was picking up. So, so no, what, what I was picking up from what Brian was saying is like the uh, transport in Fife is really expensive anyway, in most ways. Uh, it's, it's really spread out. Uh, and uh, the Fife Center for Equality is a lot of what we hear about is uh, the cost of transport, uh, our accessibility, for pe especially for people with mobility issues. and. Uh, not any, not um, 
not all lines kind of join up or make sense for when you're trying to get to work or get out of work. So a lot of people lose money even before trying to get to work. <laughs> it's really hard for them to actually do it. But at, at the same time, what we're seeing now since lockdown is there's this thing about actually a lot more work can be done remotely. Maybe it doesn't require to travel so much if it's office-based work all the time. You, you could maybe think of living uh, locally and, and not traveling as much. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly the lockdown has proven that. Uh, I mean, I think yeah, when you consider how quickly we adapted when COVID came, uh, almost overnight, you know, if, if we'd sat down before COVID and said, right, we're going to plan uh, implementation of remote working, so everybody works from home and we'll do everything remotely, it would have taken us years to come up with a plan and everybody we argued, no, that won't work, um, everybody was against it. But because we had to, um, we achieved it very quickly. Yes. Um, so it's amazing when, when the chips are down, um, we can make things happen. And kind of going back to the kind of, I think you're right, it's, a, it's almost like health and safety um, when you're looking at um, risk management. You basically say, well, um, rather than accepting that everybody has to travel, let's go on the premise that you should only travel if you really need to. So if you can work from home, work from home. Only then, if you can, will we then look at some other form of you getting there. And then even if you have to travel, how do we make the job more accessible to you to get to uh, and to then carry out the task that you need to? Um, and you're right, the, the connectivity and, and Fife, um, I, I've always described Fife as an island economy um, in the sense that we're surrounded by water on three sides uh, and we've got kind of hills on the other side. And you need to cross a bridge to get to us, uh, either from Dundee or from Edinburgh. Uh, and we've seen that when, when we had the, the problems with the fourth road bridge, when it closed, it was chaos because all of these people that would routinely commute across to Edinburgh uh, couldn't. Uh, and it almost brought our economy in Fife. Uh, yeah. A grinding hall. And I says, well, we've put ourselves in that position because we accept that for us to be successful as a, as a, uh, an area, we need to go out with our area to find work. Uh, and we need to be creating more jobs in this area. I think the other thing we've got to remember is, uh, apart from the, the bigger towns and the fact that we've got the A92 that connects some of those major towns, um, a lot of Fife is rural uh, and is badly connected. Uh, the example I'll give you is uh, we had an issue a couple of years ago where the young people from the Barati area um, wanted to go to college. So they either had to get a bus to Dunfermline, but most of them, uh, the campus was Glenrothes or Kirkcaldy. Now, to get to Glenrothes or Kirkcaldy, you've got to get a bus from Barati, which only goes every hour which takes you to Loch Gelly. You then have to change in Loch Gelly, wait 20 minutes for another bus, and then get the bus into the Glenrothes town centre, and then get another bus from the town centre out to the college. So you mm -hmm. are leaving home at six o'clock in the morning to get to the college for nine o'clock. And then they had the same journey home at night. And that was assuming that there wasn't any snow or inclement weather. Um, and that's just unrealistic. Uh, I mean, I, I remember I, I had a, a young uh, lad on placement here from Rosyth. Now, Rosyth to, to our place in a car is about 20 minutes, um, probably less if you've got a nice car. Um, in a bus, it takes an hour and a half. And there is a direct bus goes from Rosyth to Bellingray. You don't have to change, and it still takes an hour and a half to get here. So if you're working uh, here and have to get that bus or vice versa, see you, it was somebody from this area who got a job in the Maui fish factory in Rosyth and had to go to work every morning. Um, they would spend three hours a day traveling. And if you're on the early shift at Maui, which starts at six o'clock, there is no buses at three o'clock in the morning. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now, if you look at Fife, I think what didn't help the situation, I'm not saying it's, it's purely down to it, but uh, the removal and nationalisation of the bus services didn't help. And the fact that it comes down to what routes are commercially viable or what routes can be supported by the local authority. The local authority only has so much of a budget to, to subsidise some of the routes. And to be fair, they routinely review what routes are available mm -hmm. and plug any gaps. Whereas if you look at Edinburgh, I, I used to run a social enterprise in Edinburgh um, and there was buses from all over the city every five, ten minutes. You could go at the bottom of your street, jump on a bus, pay a couple of pounds, because that's all, I think it was about £2.60 at the moment, and go anywhere in Edinburgh for £2.60. Uh, and then you could come out of your work and there would, again, there would be a bus every five, ten minutes maximum. Uh, and again, you could be home uh, where a, a day return four pound fifty. Now, some of the costs uh, bus travel in Fife are three, four times that. Mm -hmm. Easy day, yeah. <laughs> um, yep. So, um, when we talk about equality of opportunity for everybody, what we need to be talking about is we need to remove those barriers. Um, now, I, I don't necessarily have the answer in relation to whether it's renationalisation or financial support. Um, I don't know. Um, it does, for me slightly, though, uh, is when we get into a situation that every year when Stagecoach publish their profits uh, and you see what their profits are, you think, well, somebody's benefiting from that mm. bus travel, uh, and it's certainly not the user. Maybe that's something that should get reviewed because um, I live in like Dysart and it's three fifty to just a station in Kirkcaldy for one way. And I think that's ridiculous because that's how much my daughter pays in Dundee for just to get round for the day kind yeah. of thing. So I think within five prices for bus fares should get reviewed if the cities can do it for cheaper and you're going a wider area where within five, it's only a short, you know, uh, distance and you're paying mm. the same amount for going all around Edinburgh kind of thing for the day. Yeah. It's a bit ridiculous and people... You know, I, I think, sorry, I think the issue you've got in Edinburgh is that the bus operator is publicly owned. It's owned by the council. Um, and, and if you've ever been on Edinburgh bus, they are state they are, they are always immaculate they mm -hmm. the time um, and they're affordable. So it makes you think if they can do it in Edinburgh, why can't they do it here? Yeah. Um, so I don't, I, I, I'm not an expert on, on public transport, but I, I think that there's certainly something quite wrong somewhere. Yeah. So how do you think um, Bragg is going to be able to move forward? You know, you know how we slowly came out of the phased lockdown and we don't know if there will be a second wave. You know, how how is Bragg like thinking about the future? You know, how to move forward in that way to help people and be, be there? I think there's two parts to it. The first part is even prior to COVID-19, we were do, dealing with a big change strategically in how we operate, um, mainly on the basis that when Bragg was created, it was created to support the Bernarty area of Fife. Now, if you know Bernarty, it's quite a small area, it's a number of villages. Um, and, and I've been here five years now. When I came in, what became uh, really obvious to me was um, the Benati area had improved. You know, um, yes, we've still got some families that are, are um, needing support, but we'd moved in a situation where we were a five-wide organisation, um, but we still delivered everything from Cross Hill. So strategically, we looked at where else we needed to have a base uh, and three years ago, we took the decision to also set up an office in Methyl. 
Now, we're in the process of buying the building that we've occupied for the last couple of years uh, called Thompson House, which is 9,000 square feet. And what we're trying to do is replicate uh, and methyl what we have done here so that um, we've helped in that we've, well, we take the view that we've helped in the regeneration of this area, but let's go to where poverty really exists in Fife. Uh, and if you look at the SMID statistics, the leaving mouth area is, is right up there. So we took a decision, right, we want to go and help other individuals in these impoverished communities. So we took a decision to open. So we were already going through that process. Uh, and it's, it is quite a, a, a change for us as an organisation, particularly when people say, but you were set up to support Benari, but you did methyl. Um, so we're having to manage that in relation to uh, our stakeholders uh, and the community that we support here to say, mm -hmm. We get funded to do separate work there, uh, but we're still doing what we can in this community. We're just at a different stage of that life cycle. So the stuff we were doing in, in methyl now is what we were doing in Barati 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and our thinking is that if we can do that and demonstrate that we can do it in methyl, there's nothing to say that, well, can we go to other communities and help them? Okay. So there's that element to it. Um, looking at the day-to-day the -day operations, I think the fact that we've come through this um, lockdown um, in a, I wouldn't say a stronger position, but probably a more resilient position, uh, and the fact that we've shown that we can be flexible, we can be adaptable um, in relation to what we're doing, um, gives me comfort that even if we do go into another lockdown scenario, and, and I have to say to the staff, right, we're back to working from home again. Um, we can do it. We've shown that we can do it. Uh, we have slowly started reopening. Um, this isn't my house I'm sitting in. This is my office at Cross Hill. Uh, I now spend um, a day a week working from home. I spend a day a week working from Methyl. And I spend three days a week working from Cross Hill. Wow. Uh, that is down to the fact that we have set up two distinct bubbles at Cross Hill and two distinct bubbles at Methyl with our staff. So I'm in one of the Cross Hill bubbles. I'm also in one of the Methyl bubbles. Um, but the only reason I work from home on a Monday is Methyl, I live in West Fife, uh, so it's a fair joint up to Methyl. So rather than go to Methyl two days a week and Cross Hill two, two days a week, I just go to Methyl one day a week. Um, and these bubbles mean that if we do get into a situation that people have to self-isolate, I'm only self-isolating one bubble. Um, and then the other bubble are then stepping in and making sure that everything is covered whilst these staff. I, and in and touch wood, I'd like to be in a position where if we do have to uh, isolate, it's not on the basis that somebody is infected. Um, so that they can still, you know, and it's not affecting their health, so they can still work from home. Mm -hmm. Again, because we've got that adaptability in relation to our service design, uh, it shouldn't have an impact on the support that we're providing to the participants that we are working with at the moment. Okay. Elric, is there anything else you would like to ask for we finish up for the day? No, I'm, I'm just really interested. I think it's really good taking this. I mean, you don't have a choice. You have to take all these safety measures and think about things because it's it's so difficult to. What if someone you're working with suddenly has COVID? That you're like, how oh, we? You need to help them, but you need to support the business. I think a lot of people are in that situation, so it's really good to hear what you're doing. I think that's what might inspire other organisations to think about, you know, a bit bigger. <laughs> you need to think about your employees, but the organisation, but also the individuals themselves. So it's really good to hear about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was on an employability um, forum event with Pegs Bailey this morning, uh, and uh, and I said that I said, you know, we focused on the people that we support and the anxieties that they've got during the whole crisis, and and the fact that it's the tip of the iceberg. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs over the next six months, a year, um, and, and we need to be there to support them. And I, and I was really pleased by how my team and our partners have responded to support people in need. At the same time, um, 
I'm, I'm acutely aware of the anxieties my own staff have about coming back into the office, about um, working safely. Um, so I've done everything that I can to put in place the risk assessments, the safe systems of work, uh, hand sanitization bubbles. I've done everything I can as an, em as a, as an employer and a colleague to support them during this. Um, but equally, what I've said to them is, but you need to recognise is, um, I can do all of this, but if you're still going out and putting yourself at risk socially um, in relation to your home environment or your social uh, circle, um, there's a, a possibility that you could bring that infection in from outside. So I think the thing I can ask of you is I will do everything I can to support you during this to make sure that we all come through this uh, in one piece. I, and all have a role and a job at the end of this, but I, I need to rely on you to do the same when you're not at work. Yeah. You know, I think that's a reminder for responsibility for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody says it's common sense, but it's amazing how people react sometimes. Um, their definition of common sense is slightly different to yours and really staying safe. Um, and it is it is hard when you you can become complacent uh, and forget, you know, um, mm. just about going to the shop. Oh, I haven't got a mask, uh, or I haven't got, you know. I think uh, I think back even myself as I had I've got hand sanitizer here in my desk. Uh, I've got one in the car. We've got we've got them at every door. Uh, we've got the automatic ones. Um, and at the start of this, you know, every five minutes I was sanitising my hands, but now I've got to actually remember to do it um, when I get in the car. Um, and that worries me slightly because we are almost becoming normalised to things now mm -hmm. and forgetting we still yeah. need, you know, the virus hasn't gone away, it's still with us. Um, and I think that that's the message that's coming out. I think the thing that will change is um, it's, I'd hate to think that we would go back to a national lockdown again, but I think there's certainly going to be a prevalence of localised lockdowns um, as time goes on. Yeah, I, it, all, it all depends on what speaks up. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the thing is, is, I don't think our economy could, could take another hit of a national lockdown. I think the government have to try and find a balance where it's, it's specific areas or specific rules. And I mean, the, the, the suggestion today about um, in England about um, no more than six people meeting uh, is mm -hmm. an example of that. Um, personally, um, I, I, I do worry more about young people um, because of this message that they're almost immune you know, they, they won't suffer from it, or if they do get it, it will just be like a mild cold. But I think they're forgetting the impact that it's having on um, their families and business and the communities that they live in. Um, and my only ask of them is sometimes you, you maybe need to think broader than just your own uh, wish to go out with your pals for a drink or meet up with your pals, even if you're doing it in the park. The fact that there's, you know, a dozen of you is... Um, is still a risk. Um, so it's, it is hard and I think things that will be tested over time. I, 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 and I, I do take into consideration um, as a youngster, I never followed the rules. I never ever done what was asked of me. Um, it's, it's just, <laughs> um, to be fair, I still don't follow the rules for some things. I'm just a collective now. <laughs> I'm being reminded by my colleagues that there has been a uh, transportation that we we helped out with, which was called um, transporting people in Fife, that was led by Fife Council. But it was it was posed, I think, uh, at the start of the lockdown. But it's still available, so we we post it on on the event page if anyone is interested from today about it. And uh, it was a lot of discussion as from it was from, done from a PB participatory budgeting approach about what do we do about transporting Fife, what do we do about because there's so much money as you say that the local authority has. And then we need to think about uh, what lines are open and how, and it was about involving people into that. But obviously, that's been posed with a lockdown as well. But uh, I've been reminded my colleagues that it's still on, so I'll make sure to share that 
in the event pages afterwards. And we, we can still continue that conversation. It's really important. Anyway, that's me for, for now. Sorry. Puffing on too much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right. Um, I, I'd like to thank you, Brian, for coming along today, you know, and telling us everything, because to be honest, I never knew nothing about Bragg and I've been totally researching before today just so I understood everything, you know, about the place. Um, well, thank you for coming along to Let's Chat today. Thank you, Leslie, for interpreting again. Um, Tomorrow we have another Let's interview at 10 a.m. with S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, Sarah will be along for that interview. And then at, one at 3 o'clock, is it Elric? Mm -hmm. We have um, music from Ely Hutchison. So please come back tomorrow for another interview and some more uh, mus our musical acts this week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks again. Thanks, Ron. Bye. <laughs>